Yes, you're up. Good afternoon and thank you for joining today's webinar from Spec Innovations, NOC 101, a webinar for new users. My name is Sarah Craig and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Let's go over some quick housekeeping and introductions before we get started. First quick announcement, there has been a change in speakers. Dr. Dan will be giving the presentation today. For those of you who may not be aware, SPEC Innovations provides systems engineering services and solutions to the aerospace, defense, and intelligence communities. Our flagship software, InnoSlate, provides users with an all-in-one systems engineering software solution with requirements management, analytics, modeling, simulation, and analysis of alternative tools. We help organizations securely collaborate on critical critical projects throughout the product or systems lifecycle. During the presentation, feel free to send us questions using the panel on the right, and we will get them answered in the question and answer part of the webinar. The webinar is being recorded, and we will make it available to you after the live presentation, so be sure to keep an eye on it in your inbox. Now I'd like to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Stephen Dam. Today he is going to show you just how easy it is to learn InnoSlate. Dr. Dan will show you beginners' common mistakes and tips and tricks to help you on your journey to master InnoSlate. Throughout the presentation, you are going to see a live walkthrough of the tool. He will walk you through the ins and outs of the tool and show you how you become an expert InnoSlate user in no time. Dr. Dam is the president and founder of Spec Innovations. He has been involved with research experiments, operations analysis, software development, systems engineering, and training for more than 40 years. Dr. Dan participated in the development of C4ISR architecture framework and DOD architecture framework. He has also received an expert systems engineering professional certification from NCOSI. He currently is applying systems engineering techniques to various DOD, DOE, and commercial projects. And now we'll hand over the controls to Dr. Dam and we will get started. Thanks, Sarah. So I'm um, just going to give you a little background on InnoSlate and the company. Just uh, Sarah mentioned a little bit about us uh, and our background, but the real, the real key is that we started in 1993 and we're doing systems engineering using these kinds of tools for quite a number of years. We were using other people's tools, yes. <laughs> and uh, we, we got to a point where we realized that there were a lot of problems with today's tools. Uh, they're difficult to use, uh, particularly there's a big focus on the SysML tools and things like that, which is just a set, a set of drawing uh, uh, framework. It's a drawing framework principally at the moment. Uh, they're trying to extend it with an ontology and things like that, but fundamentally it's a drawing framework. And so, the, but there are a lot of different ways people want to see the information and, and more than just drawings even. And so uh, we, we saw that things were not moving forward using new techniques and the new capabilities. Um, the, the models that when you built a model in these different things, they, they weren't executable. They didn't have ways to test them using discrete event or Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, and, and as it turns out, it turns out Monte Carlo is almost essential. If you don't have that, you probably aren't really doing a good job of modeling. Um, and then limited life cycle management. Uh, that's that's a really big problem. Uh, you know, you, you have to kludge together about seven different tools to cut, cut across the entire system engineering life cycle. Well, that gets expensive, and it's and it's very labor intensive in terms of moving data back and forth between these different tools or, or trying to link them together uh, because they weren't designed to work together. They don't they don't tend to work together. And then one of the big things that we, I ran into. Uh, we worked on some of the big architecture projects for the Department of Defense, and we have hundreds of modelers at times. And it, the lack of collaboration features was just a nightmare. So uh, today, what we did was we we uh, tried to resolve these problems with InnoSlate, and we did that by first of all helping develop a, a new language, uh, the lifecycle modeling language. It's an open standard. It subsumes SysML, so it does include SysML. Uh, in it. Uh, it actually provides an ontology for SysML and actually did that back in 2014. Um, but we also went cloud. That was the other big, big change we went. The new technology in, when we were starting this development in 2010 was cloud computing. And uh, the, the commercial world jumped on the cloud very, very quickly. Uh, the government has been a little slower. Uh, they are coming up to speed pretty fast now and, and are moving forward now on cloud computing. 
What cloud gives us is a whole bunch of things. It's things like the ability to use a web browser. So there isn't an individual installation. Uh, that helps, uh, the, it helps control the software better. The updates are pushed quickly to the cloud, things like that. So there's a lot of things that make your life a lot easier as a user. Uh, scalability was another reason we went cloud because again, I, we work on some of these very large projects and we were talking about millions of entities being needed. <clears throat> and so we've tested in a slate to 10 million entities and thousand simultaneous users. So that's pretty enterprise grade for today. Um, will that be enterprise grade for tomorrow? Of course not. We'll keep pushing that envelope as quick, as far as we can. <laughs> uh, and of course, the cloud also makes it easier for us to collaborate. So uh, for that, we provide some specific uh, capabilities within the tool, like real-time collaboration. So there's a group chat. There's also the real-time indicators uh, when you're looking at an object and somebody else is looking at an object in another view. So that helps that. And then the other part is the, the ease of communications to all the stakeholders. So you it, really, the design is meant to be so that you can give people information in, in the form that they're used to seeing it, comfortable seeing it, and comfortable working with it. Uh, then they can respond better to you with that. Uh, of course, lifecycle management, we said that's got to be in the tool. We've got to have the capability to cover the entire span. So we do full requirements analysis and management, not just management of the requirements, but actually analytics. And we have to talk about some of that in a little bit. Uh, full modeling capabilities. So again, not just the nine system L diagrams. We have currently 25 different diagram types and two chart types and counting. We are adding them all the time. Um, it turns out you can't visualize the problem easily enough with just any number, small number of diagrams. In fact, you need an extremely large set of diagram types to, to do that. Uh, test center, that's another big deal. Uh, test center is where we capture the test uh, expected results, the test cases with the expected results, the actual results, their status. So you can track that. You can link it back easily to the requirements. What were the verification requirements that you used? So all that is all tightly coupled, easily to work together. And so you can easily create your, your, your matrices that you need to create your traceability matrices, things like that are available just right out of the box in the tool. And then probably the most unique thing about our tool is documents view. So we have now decided that documents can be a model too. So what's a model? It is, it's just a visual representation of information. And so the key is what you're looking for is reusability of the information and traceability. Well, with our documents view, you get both and you can author any kind of document you want. So that's, that really helps you do a much, much better job of documentation. And, 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 oh, by the way, that you know, all those models and things you have, have a home in Documents View, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Uh, for accuracy, uh, again, we have a full discrete event simulator and Monte Carlo simulator. Both of them simulate cost schedule and performance, okay? Remember, one of our jobs as systems engineers is to optimize cost schedule and performance of the system. By the way, that's the flip side of what the program manager does. They do the cost schedule and performance um, optimization for the program. And again, that's why there's a big synergy between systems engineering and program management, which everybody has now recognized. Uh, Incosi and PMI co-wrote a book together uh, on that integration of systems engineering and program management. Um, another thing we did for accuracy is we've, we've adopted the technology of natural language processing. So natural language processing and machine learning are, uh, are, are branches of artificial intelligence. So everybody's heard of artificial intelligence, but there's many different types of artificial intelligence. So NLP and these machine, pre-trained machine learning algorithms we use uh, basically allow us to uh, do a lot of these analytical things you're looking for. And again, we're gonna, we're, we've just started uh, scratch the surface with using those, and we're gonna apply those throughout the tool. Um, of course, it actually is applied throughout the tool through intelligence view. Uh, interoperability is another big thing. Uh, everybody's pushed this whole idea that you've got to be able to be able to represent things in many different formats. And then we have a DODAF dashboard. Uh, we can build a UAF dashboard if there's actually a policy reason to do so. So far, I haven't seen that, uh, but we were looking at that. And there are other frameworks as well we're looking at perhaps support.
Uh, in the in the import export though of data, and we still need to be able to move data between tools from time to time. Uh, in fact, we recommend a lot of importing <laughs> to InnoSlate because InnoSlate is sort of a sponge. It, it can absorb all the information and tie it together and link it together in some unique ways. But we've also been exploring uh, de developing uh, interactions with the uh, interfaces with the uh, design engineering software. So, in fact, in our 4.4 release that's coming out here imminently uh, this week for the cloud and in a couple of weeks for uh, for the enterprise version, we expect uh, that we will be uh, interfacing with uh, MATLAB, um, Systems Toolkit, and GitHub. Uh, and, and again, the, the MATLAB and Systems Toolkit, uh, which is SDK, uh, those are used for co-simulation with physics-based modeling and things like that that you might want to do uh, in, tied to your higher level modeling that we do in InnoSlate with our discrete event in Monte Carlo simulators. Um, the GitHub is, is, is a part of this whole idea of the digital engineering thread and working through that part of the process where you're starting to integrate things like software. So if you're not familiar with GitHub, it's a software repository tool. It's very effective. It's used by a lot of people and we use it ourselves. So, so again, these are things that we're expanding to and we're adding more in the future. So again, one we support the entire life cycle. So our documents view, you often start there, you author your documents and work in that view. Um, the requirements view is a special case of the documents view. It brings in our quality score, the quality checker, things like that, this NLP quality checker. Um, modeling, we have, again, all those different diagram types and charts and ways to help you visualize the information in a, in a graphical manner. Again, we're always looking for ideas of how could we do that better? How could that be uh, supported? A CAD viewer. So CAD, we have the ability to view CAD. And again, that's another upgrade coming in our 4.4. Uh, our we actually add new diagram, new CAD types to be able to be able to visualize, plus the color and material files and things like that can be added with it. Um, simulation, as I mentioned, discrete event and Monte Carlo. And of course, you use that in the early phases of the life cycle to do a predictive analysis. And then now you can take the results from your design engineering activities, calibrate your simulation, and turn it into a predictive simulation for the actual operations. Um, test center gives us the ability to, again, capture all those test cases, the results that you can have many different test suites. You can set up test cycles as you need to as well. So again, this, we are in the process of automating that as well. So that's another thing, a little bit let downstream. It's not, not here with four fours, but coming downstream, we're definitely looking at how to do more auto, test automation and interact with other test automation tools like Selenium and LabVIEW. Uh, risk analysis. So we, we have risk matrix and a risk burn down chart right now. Those are the two, two charts we, we use for that purpose. Uh, we probably need to look at the opportunity chart and add that as well. Again, there's just so many things to add. <laughs> uh, and timeline diagram. So timeline diagram gives us a Gantt chart kind of format to do your timeline development. This is used heavily for project planning, but the systems engineer creates a systems engineering management plan, which has a timeline in it too. So you can use that as well. We use that on all our projects right now. And then cost, of course, you can create a work breakdown structure in it. Uh, cost is an independent entity in our schema. And so you can track it that way. Okay, so that's kind of my normal pattern. I kind of do that for a demo for people pretty frequently. Um, but what we really want to get down to is, okay, I'm a, you're a new person to the tool. What what? How can I help you get into the tool, using it more effectively and understanding it better? And so these are some of the topic areas we're going to talk to today. So let me go through one by one and talk through each of these items. I think I've got all these things, you know. Okay, so understand the ontology. So first of all, there is a schema, database schema that's underneath that underlies this, the tool. 
Now, you may want to extend that early in the process because you 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 want you remember this is defining your language, how you're going to communicate with other people. So that's important. And in, as part of that extension, you probably want to create a conceptual data model. Okay, that, what that is is basically saying how are my uh, different entities and relationships and attributes connected to each other, and and how am I adjusting them from the baseline schema that we provide for, out of the lifecycle modeling language. And of course, we've extended that for NOSLATE as well, uh, I would say. So it's a little beyond what LML has directly. Uh, and then another good suggestion, and uh, many people have found this helpful, is there's a relationship matrix that's in the specification. We recommend printing that out and putting it on your desk. It, it'll help you find things quickly. Uh, and, and it gives you a nice visual to, to work with. Uh, there are other ways to do that, and you can kind of explore that, and I'll show you some ways to explore that as well. So just so you, I know a lot of you probably are familiar with, but I'll just briefly touch on, and I'll show you where to find the specification for this. So this, there's kind of a documentation model, which has the artifact, the statements, and requirements in it. So that's your document. Okay, and that's what it's heavily focused in on documents view in InnoSlate. The modeling comes in both functional and physical, okay? And the primary entities for the for the functional or the action and the input output entity, that's your flow, that's your like your data flow, things like that. And then the physical model is the is the asset, that's your physical thing. That can be a person, that can be a system, that can be whatever. Okay. And then a subclass that is resource, and that's an important subclass. So that's that's uh, that's used for uh, uh, doing resource modeling, where you have things being consumed, or things being created, or things being seized. Uh, so so this again, that it's a part of that physical world. But it, again, these interact together. Uh, conduits, the other thing, the conduit is where the IOs flow over. So conduits have latency and capacities to them. So it, it lets you um, use that to help you do some uh, basic communications modeling, which you could calibrate with uh, higher fidelity tools like Riverbed and things like that. You can take the uh, distributions out of ris Riverbed for your network and then model that and put that into your, to your analysis. But maybe you don't have that, maybe you're not that far down in your network. You wanna make some estimates and do some, some uh, parametric analysis. You could use it to do that. Um, and then again, speaking of parametrics and program models, is the other items and the classes below, uh, characteristic measure, location, cost, risk, decision, and time. And these are all there to help you do a better job of tracking your program elements. And uh, by the way, you're, everybody's wondering, well, where are my KPPs? That's in measure. Measure gives me a place where I put my KPPs. So again, these are quick things to tell you. I'm gonna show you again in a minute where they get the spec for this. Uh, the other thing to recognize is we don't have just ND classes, we have relationships between them. So think about the ND classes as sort of the nouns of the language and the relationships are your verbs, okay? And so these are your verbs. And so these are the basic traceability elements you have with it. Um, now, you, you will find that sometimes I have a requirement and it has to go directly to an asset, okay? For that, I use a relationship called satisfied by. And then we also can have associate requirements with test cases. So I use verified by for that purpose. So again, we have other relationships that you're not seeing here, but these are your primary flow down, your decomposition you have from your, again, your document model, to your functional model, to your physical model with assets, and then the characteristics associated with assets. Okay, so again, I, there's a lot of detail on this. There's some great books and available and resources. We're gonna talk about that too in a minute. So this is the matrix though we were suggesting printing out. This is, this is an 11 by 17 out of the specification. It, it, if you notice, everything's kind of connected to everything. <laughs> So I'm sorry, there's a little bit of an eye chart. That's why I blew up a portion of it. So you can see between assets, other assets, it has these different relationships. So we have the peer-to-peer -peer relationship at the bottom there, the related to relates. That's a typical one we use. Uh, by the way, there's an attribute on that relationship you can use to help you track context of that relationship. Uh, 
we added the orbit and orbited spy because we use this for aerospace work. And one of the big problems I always found was I was missing that kind of a, 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 a relationship just because two assets together by the sun and the moon, I'm sorry, sun and the earth going around each other, right? I mean, the sun, sun's in the middle and the earth's going around it. I need that relationship. It's not decomposed by relationship, which is again, the parent child relationship standard that. And so you see those are consistent so that decomposed by and related to are in every one of these. So that means that every one of these classes of information is decomposable, which you saw in the previous diagram by that, that rounded uh, circle arrow, giving you that idea. So let me show you where to get the specification. It's at lifecyclemodeling.org. I'm gonna sneak over here to uh, that, that website. So it's lifecyclemodeling.org. Hopefully everybody can see that, it's a little dark. Um, and then if you come down here, right in the right in the middle of it, it says, read this LML specification, <laughs> okay? And so you just click on that, and you can come down and see it. And if you're really into ontology, not only does we have the specification, okay? And the relationship matrix is, is that printout you can make of that matrix. But also we have an OWL file. So there is actually an OWL file. And if you need it, uh, we have it available. If for some reason it's not uploaded here, I don't know why. Um, and there's a lot of other things about the, the steering committee. Again, if you want to see, again, that's not me. <laughs> uh, Dr. Warren Vanneman is, is the chairman. I'm the secretary. And then we have lots of other members. So it's, this is, this is a, a, a labor of love for a bunch of us in, in the systems engineering world who have been here. And of course, the intern managed to put his own picture on since he's the one who built the website. <laughs> so that was good. Um, okay, so uh, just kind of that is a that's a quick, very very quick uh, overview of the LML ontology. And so again, think about your language at the very beginning of your project. If you don't, if you don't, you're going to run into problems later on downstream. Doesn't mean you can't make changes, but keep it up to date. Another thing I would recommend is don't change it a lot. Uh, particularly if you're not familiar with the with the language, uh, don't go. Particularly then, don't go starting to add things to it because you're going to find you're just going to make it more complex. The whole purpose, what we tried to do, is limiting the number of classes of information, uh, forces us to think about well, where does the information go, and that's usually the biggest problem people have is what bin does it fit in. Now remember also with the with the tool with InnoSlate you can translate all those kinds of things as well. So let me go to InnoSlate now briefly and show you a few places where the ontology is explicit. So one of the first places you might jump into is database view. So database view shows you what classes are active right here. And when you create a new entity, there's the whole list of all the classes, including any you've added. So somebody added a spec class in here. Um, so, so that can be added fairly easily too, but it's, they're right here and it's available to you. Again, there's different types of connections. There's a logical and a conduit, different types of locations, physical, orbital, and virtual. So again, as you get more familiar with the schema, uh, this helps you navigate it very well. Um, if you have any specific item here, so let me just double click on one of these items here. That gives me the entity view for that item. So this shows me the attributes for it. And then over here on the right is my relationships. So I get my relationships that I have. Now there's a pinned, a popular, which is ones you're using, and then all. Now all gets pretty long, as you can see. Okay, and if I want to put one of these on my pinned list, I would come over and look, and if there's a pin with a plus on it, I can then add that to the pinned list. So let me just do that for fun here. Okay, so now if I go back to pinned, and I look for depends on, it's right here. Okay, oh, let me take, and you get rid of it just as easily. You come back over that pin and unclick it, and there it goes. Okay, so again, very easy way to see the schema in a couple of different places in, in the views. If you need to modify the schema, that's what the schema editor for is. By the way, 
if you haven't seen the menu has all these different things I have up, up on top here, and you just can pin or unpin those items up here as you need them. So let's again talk about the schema editor itself. So schema editor is an owner privilege. So you have to be the owner of the project to change the schema. Uh, by the way, the, at the organizational level, which is the broader level across where you have different projects within, uh, you'll usually be put within an organization. Here's my spec innovations organization. And so then I, each of the projects have uh, different owners. And so you can have your own projects and then you can share data with other people through the sharing mechanism. Um, but let's talk about these information. So as I come down here, labels. Now labels are part of the schema. It's the typing that we use. So if you hear about stereotyping or typing from other languages, that's what this really is. This gives us ability to label things. And the beauty of it is it allows us to use multiple labels on an object. So now, if I decide that uh, that something has, um, oh, I don't know, um, let's look at a couple of these that might fit together. Act it's an activity uh, and it's some kind of analysis that's being performed. Um, again, that, that's, that's a requirement. So again, that's not a good connection. Let's just find the one that is uh, asset. So here, uh, block, and then uh, maybe I have another one down here for asset. Uh, context so so that may be a context block okay so that may be something you'd want to put together that way um, so anyway you can add these as you need to again if you're an owner you can add labels as you need to do that so that helps you a lot um, classes and again if you ever get confused about the classes all you have to do is click on classes and even if you're read only you click on it and it will show you the definition of it so this is the definition right out of the specification Okay, so you can see exactly what it is. And down here you see the attributes and you can add attributes as you need to. Okay, and relationships. So again, these add targets. So to create the relationships is another, another uh, option in the, uh, in the actual scheme editor itself. So, um, so again, so if you get confused, this is a good place to come and say, okay, here's where it is right here. So if I don't happen to have the schema right, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the specification handy, I can come in within the tool and see where these things connect. Similarly, um, let me go back here. Uh, so again, relationships are here. So that's where you, you add a new relationship. And then, now remember you have to add both ways of a relationship. All our relationships are bi-directional. That gives us traceability both forward and back. And again, that's an essential element of how we are approaching this problem. Okay, uh, one more quick thing on um, on the entity view itself. I'm double clicking to get to this, by the way. So again, if you're not sure, you know what can be added and how to add it, you click over here that down bar, and you can create a decision at relate the existing. Okay. So that's that's one place. Another, if you're in let's other some other view like documents view. So let's go jump over there for a minute. So documents view. If I'm in there, I can see my attributes and relationships once I click on an object, and there's my relationships. And so this is a way to quickly get to the relationships. Okay. And if you add, now if you add existing, you have the option of doing things that are here or going to another project and finding that information. Okay, so, and these are projects within your organization. And so you can create the cross project relationships that way. Okay. So again, very quick ideas of how to help you kind of find your way around the tool and see the different aspects of it, the ontology. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next topic, and please, if there have any questions, put them in the in the in the, in the question uh, field, and we'll be getting to them at the end of the web, at webinar. Okay, so next topic was knowing your resources. So we have lots of resources to help you get started and help you understand things, 
And frankly, I find myself still after all these years going to some of these when I have a question about something or something I don't use very often, I find myself needing to go to this. So let's go see what that looks like. So over here is the uh, website itself, the main website, innoslate.com. Hopefully all of you are familiar with that. You sign up or sign in uh, as you need to from here if you want. Um, and so the resources page is right here. So you click on that and it takes me over to that area. Now at the top here, we have Help Center, User's Guide, Share Space. So we'll get to those in a minute. But also then quick links to the white papers, events, webinars, other things, videos, blogs. But if I scroll down, I can also see all those, those things, blogs, at least the, some of the initial blogs, you can get, you can click the more to get more. Uh, webinars, similarly for that, videos, lots of different ways to get this in white papers. And then again, we'll get to share space in a minute, but down at the bottom, we have books. There are books out for this, and I highly recommend this essential LML. That looks like it's a thick book, but it's really not. It's actually a stack of th about uh, five or six books. <laughs> so, so it's actually a very thin paperback. It's very easy to read. Uh, it's a nice summary. It'll explain maybe a little bit more about the specification. I'd call it a companion to the specification. Uh, if you want to see a book on with process information, that my real MBSE book has a lot of information about processes, how to actually implement uh, the language and use it on a project. And then if you're doing the DOD architecture framework, this is now a classic. Uh, it's been used as textbooks at, at, at uh, some of the military uh, universities. Uh, so that's available as well. Um, let's see here, upcoming events, uh, on down, you keep going new webinars, all kinds of stuff there. Now that's that's one of the places you can start. Uh, another good place to start is the, uh, I believe it's the Help Center. Yeah, Help Center. So Help Center has these how-to guides, 101, uh, different different uh, types of things you're doing, requirements, model-based systems engineering, B and B, and then there's an administrator's guide pretty well. Also, this is where you get your release notes. So when you when 4.4 comes out and you want to see, oh, what's in 4.4, you just click on it and you can see all the specific enhancements, bug fixes, things like that. Particularly if you've been kind of waiting for something, uh, you can look here and see if we if you got it. Uh, by the way, if you if you have asked or made a request like this and you haven't heard back from us directly, uh, feel free to contact support and ask, well, what did, did you guys fix this bug? <laughs> That's okay. And then they've got links to these uh, user's guide and some other things as well. Project dashboard, sharing projects, all kinds of things. So again, that's helpful to you, I hope. Uh, let's go back. And then a uh, user's guide is here as well from that top link. And this gives you pretty detailed information about each and every item. So if you're wondering what's the XY plot and how does it work and how to create it, and all those kinds of things, it's all right here, okay? Now, like any other user's guide, it does take a little bit of looking around to find exactly where things are. So uh, schema editors talked about here customizing classes, relationships, workflow, uh, things like that are helpful. Uh, if, if you're using the simulators, there's a lot of information about the simulators, including simulator controls, which talks about the scripts. So again, this helps you with your scripting of your simulation. Now, we've tried to make it so you don't have to do a lot of that, and in general, you don't. Uh, but, but we do find every now and then, learning the scripting language, it's relatively simple. Is, uh, is a very valuable tool for your modeling. Okay, so um, let's go back a little. <coughs> uh, share space. So share space is one of the places I am extremely happy about because I've been wanting to do this for years and we had some interns go through and parse a lot of documents. So like cybersecurity things you're looking for, if you're looking for the risk management framework for, for cybersecurity, that's in there. The CMMC, at least a draft of it, is in there. So you have things already parsed and easy to work with. We have all the JSIDS documents. 
the, all the templates for the JSITS documents if you're doing DOD work. Um, many specifications and standards that are out there and available. So there's a massive amount of these things and you know, feel free to go through and, and work with those as you need to. Uh, also, we solicit your contributions. So if you've done something like you've parsed the government document particularly, uh, and you want to share that with everybody so, so we don't have to keep spending the government's money, which is, oh, by the way, our money <laughs> on those kinds of things, then let's let's go ahead and share that so people can, can stop uh, doing that same thing over and over and over. Okay, so I think I've hit most of the resources. There's one other one that I wanted to talk about briefly, and that's actually here at your organizational dashboard. So, so when you come into this organizational dashboard, you've probably seen this. It says start a guided tour. Do that. If you have not done this, it is actually very cool. It walks you through different types of problems. You can pick different things. This autonomous vehicle uh, gets you into the uh, requirement side of things particularly, uh, although it, there's some modeling simulation as well. There's a fire sat that gets you big into the modeling simulation. And then if you're a software person, this music uh, streaming service is meant for those kinds of people, uh, folks. And then what you do is you select one of them, and it doesn't matter which one you pick. And then you can select different types of things you're interested in hearing about. And you can pick one or, or two. You have to pick at least two, but you can pick them all if you want just to walk through it all at once. Uh, that's a great way to help you get started. Okay, um, let's go back. And by the way, that creates a project for you, just even doing the step I did. So I have to go delete that whole that extra project. So, <laughs> so just be aware of that as well. Okay, so let's get back again. Our quick links to our to recent projects are here. Okay, so I think I I beat that one to death. Ah, the next one, the wrench. So if you're not familiar, up in the top right-hand corner of many of the diagrams is, is a little wrench. And that little wrench is the place where you can get, get all kinds of help for things. There can be settings. There can be uh, different ways to hide information or show information. Uh, in this one, uh, I can take an action diagram and generate an asset diagram from it, the physical diagram from it. Um, Again, I can show my cross project indicators if I see if I'm looking for stuff that where my cross project things are. So lots of different options in these. Uh, there'll also be uh, some help uh, options in some of the certain diagrams, and that's that's really nice with it as well. Um, and in fact, in the traceability assist has the trace. The, I'm sorry, the traceability matrix has traceability assist and suspect assist, for example. That's extremely helpful. Um, so let's just show you that. Uh, let's go to a couple of diagrams here. And let's pick uh, one of my favorites. Um, I think I've got it here. Uh, physical IO, there we go. So a physical IO diagram is actually gives you a lot of information. So you see that some of the lines are gold instead of being black. Well, that means there's something missing in it. And so to, to find out what it is, I can click on it and hit repair, and it shows me that information. Well, also, though, I can come over to that wrench and check model and see all the problems. What are all the difficulties? What's missing in here? And in these cases, uh, uh, the data isn't being transferred by a conduit. So I haven't completed my modeling. This is just telling me I'm not finished with my modeling. I don't have a complete example, okay? So that, that's, that's, that's some of the things that can really help you make a much, much better model, okay? So to be aware of that and, and go each of the diagrams and take a look and see what's there for you and, and see if that can help you do something better. Okay, and I'm kind of mindful of time because I want to give you guys some time to uh, talk about, uh, ask what your questions. So uh, there's a common framework, by the way, behind everything. So the, 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 what, the, what you're really seeing, everybody says, well, gee, can you put this on the dashboard? 
These are all dashboards, actually. The data in the database is being reflected in different ways for, for, for what you want to see. And so if you change that object in the database one place, it automatically updates it everywhere else it should be. So, and you, so for example, if I create a relationship between two things, that's going to show up on different diagrams, okay? And it'll automatically show there as it should, because that's the proper configuration of your data. And so use that whenever you can. Uh, again, I want to leave some time for questions. So let me just move on to this one. Uh, embedding live data. So if you don't know how to do this, this is one of the things that's extremely helpful. It's in any description field, you can embed live data. So let me show you how that's used, particularly in documents view. So for a document, think of something like a test plan, or even here, let's, uh, this is a requirements document. I see a diagram here already. So, so there's this diagram that's in here. This is actually one of our auto-generated uh, requirements documents. It was actually generated from this diagram. So we went to that diagram, and again, that little wrench, it said, generate SRD, and that's what it does is generate this document. And it embeds here the, the diagram, and if I update the diagram, it'll update it here automatically. So, and so you can get that yourself anytime you want. You just go ahead and come down here. The first is our static kinds of link. There's a hyperlink, there's the image and table. Okay, you can build those, are all static. But the diagram is any of the diagrams that are available. So I could embed any of those in here I wanted to. Similarly, if I go down a little bit, I have charts. So I can do that with charts. I can also do that with different ending notation. What that is, ending notation is, is taking an attribute value and putting it in there. So, so for example, if I KPP, and I'm trying to say, show this KPP has this value, I can then select that. And then if I update the value later, it'll show me that it's been changed. And then date, table notation. Uh, it automatic, I'm sorry, automatically update to that latest version. Same thing with table notation. You can actually create live tables, much like you do on the dashboard as well. So we, again, that's available on the dashboard, but it's also available in every description field. So again, this is a great way for you to work with the information and embed it and reuse it. Uh, we do a lot of work now where we are creating these diagrams, we're creating even other documentation information, and we then merge it together uh, using the cross-project relationships. And that gives us that integrated diagram, uh, integrated information set. So this is a great way to make sure your data is authentic. You have the latest version of everything. That actually leads us to the next slide, which is configuration management tools. So one of the things we, we have an activity feed to help you track what's been changed when but that's just a small subset of what's in history so history is up for each and every object so we have that available as well there's baselining okay you said we baseline the documents and also test cycles by the way if you want to baseline your entire project just simply make a copy of it or export it to a, a, a dot .ino file or a dot xml file depending on whether you want to include all the pictures and files and other things you've uploaded with it. It's a lot there. Um, and then, or, uh, and so, uh, just again, let me, I can spend a second on that last one, so let me just go show you some of that uh, with it. There we go. Uh, so let's just go take a quick look at what the, so if I want to get any object, uh, again, let me just go to database view. So let's just pick that same object we have again here. You know, it, when I click on it in almost any view, I believe in any view now, you basically have that history dialog to, available to you right here. So you don't have to go to the end of the view itself to see the history dialog anymore. So you click on that and there it is. It shows all the changes, who changed it, when they changed it, okay? Doesn't exactly have why they changed it, but it at least has <laughs> who changed it and when and how, okay, how it was changed. Um, so that's that's a great way to work with it. Um, I mentioned the activity feed, that's here up on the dashboard, and you can see who did what when. You can even sort this by individual users. I'm sorry, there's, you can, uh, there's a report, I'm sorry, that's the activity feed report. And then you can also even sort it and filter it by username. So you can look for specific people, what did they work on, and what were they 
they doing, what, what, how they were working with the tool. Uh, the baselining is found in Documents View again, and that's right here, and it's in the More tab. So baselining, we, we were get, adding more and more of these things, so we ended up creating a More tab instead of having a bunch of buttons. It made it harder if you were using a smaller profile device like an iPhone or an iPad, uh, which I use it on all the time, uh, then it was harder to see. So we added this capability. By the way, notice there is an acronym extractor too, which is very valuable <laughs> if you're doing that kind of work. Uh, and then for the test center, we have test cases uh, times test cycles. So that's, that's also up here in the more tab, new test cycle. So you can create a new test cycle as you need them. I only have the one here, so. Um, okay, so again, very, hopefully very quick. Um, and then let's get talk about intelligence view and the quality checker. Got a lot more stuff here. There's intelligence view, quality checker, traceability assist, suspect assist. Those are all different NLP applications. Um, let me get, again, very, very quickly to... I hate to, sorry, I'm jumping back and forth so much, but it's the best way to show you everything. And so if you see here, uh, I have my quality checker results are in this quality score. And what that's doing is it's reading the quality checker again is up here in the more button. And then what it's reading is these attributes, clear, complete, consistent, correct, design, feasible, traceable, verifiable. Now these are pretty clean. And so we're getting very high scores. And, but I've seen many of them where they're, they're very low scores. <laughs> they're not clear, complete, consistent. And so it's finding help and helping you. But again, remember, these are just aids. These aren't a be-all and end-all. You need to go through and, and work with it yourself. Uh, <clears throat> intelligence view is probably the most hidden one, in a sense, because we have 68 heuristics. Uh, this is research that came to us from systems engineering research that was done by the Naval Postgraduate School. And so we were able to capture that, that, that research and use them at, and create algorithms against each one of these different criteria. So MD shall have in the same class, shall have different names, things like that. So this is a great way for you to find problems, potential problems for what you're doing and how you're doing and consistency. So this helps you create the consistency. So for example, it's best practices that actions begin with a verb. That's always considered best practice. Not everybody does it, that's okay, but you, you get to determine whether you like it or not. If you don't like it, hit the fix button and it'll help you fix it, okay? So again, that's a really good aid for you. Um, okay, so again, I wanna leave a little time here for you yeah, because I got one more slide. So let me do one more quick slide and then we're gonna have time for questions. Um, so the changing database view, one of the things you're going to find is it, it really helps you have two screens, okay? Uh, and 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 obviously I want to have two different versions of of the of the object in the database. So what I can do is I can come over here and I can open. Um, let's see, I, I can open a new tab. New tab to the right. And then what I can do is copy the URL, paste it. Now I have two of these. So maybe you can see this, I hope. So now I can work with both if I want to by hiding this one and go back and forth. Now, obviously the best is to have two screens and I have two screens I use it on. And so now I can go use this view and then go looking for information about it here. And I close that little window there and then help me scroll through it. Okay. So again, this is a way for you to do that. Okay. Um, well, let's let's do Q and A because uh, again, I want to leave. I had wanted to leave a little bit of time. I left just a little bit of time. <laughs> Sorry. Perfect. Sorry. Slow start. All good. Thank you, Dr. Dam. We've already received a few questions. If you haven't done so, please send your questions through the panel on the right. Feel free to ask as many questions as you have, and Dr. Dam will answer as many questions as he can before our time is up. So our first question is going to be, can customized schemas be used as a template for other projects? 
And if a project creates their own schema, can another project import that schema rather than recreating it from scratch? Yes, yes. The best way to do that is uh, right now with 4.3 is do do your schema extensions in a, in a separate project and then just ex export the XML and then use that XML as your template import. Um, in in future in 4.4, we are extending the ability to to export different parts of the project, including just the schema. And so that's another thing that can happen in the future. But if you just right now do it on in a clean project and then it's clean, it'll come in just as the template. Thank you. Our next question is: Do classes of assets have defined sets of relationships. For example, when you create a new requirement, does it include a set of relationships defined for each requirement? Um, so yes, the, each 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 um, classes of assets. That's interesting. Uh, so that each class has a different set of relationships. Now there are if you if you had subclasses of the asset, you could create those relationships as well. Uh, that way um, so and then if you if you have it will inherit the properties of the parent if you do that um, uh, subclassing so that's that's probably I think I think that gets to the question I hope <laughs> our next question is is essential LML available in soft form like a Kindle no we, we didn't go there <laughs> But it's very inexpensive, and frankly, it's a little nice book. I think you'll like to have the book. Thank you. Our next question is, can you connect changes in the model to elements in a configuration management process, like tie an engineering change request to a set of changes in the model? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. And you can you can uh, link all those together using different relationships. If you have that as an ex external uh, system, like... Uh, you're creating these different change requests in a different form. Uh, you could then export that form and in, in, import it as an artifact in, in a slate, so that way you can track them together. Um, our next question is, my company is looking into purchasing InnoSlate. If we choose the enterprise version and download it to our servers, how can a customer see the model? Is it through the URL on the web? So no, if you download it to your server, you have to give them access to your server because that's where it exists. That's where the data exists. Uh, on the cloud, our our web cloud versions, uh, they 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 could go directly there to do it if you were on the cloud. And you can implement on your own version of the enterprise on a cloud server if you want, and use it use that approach. So we have actually a number of uh, people who are using the Gov Cloud or AWS or Azure. And you, they can put it up, up there and fairly easily and and operate out, out of that those clouds. Our next question is, are you aware of Open MBEE? And is it possible to connect slash exchange data to Open MBEE? I've heard of Open MBEE. I don't know much about it. If it has a set of REST APIs or something, then perhaps we can. Uh, we do have both REST and Java APIs. That are available and so um, that, that's how we interoperate with other tools so that may be the answer to that I'm just not that familiar with it sorry <laughs> our next question is is InnoSleep built on LML or does it have its own schema uh, so so it, LML it was uh, was the s is the essence of our schema uh, we have extended it slightly uh, for example, we added the, the test cases for test center, things like that. But in general, we're using, I'd say, 89% is, is just pure LML. Thank you. Our next question is, can a user relate a requirement to an element of a visual model? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's that's done all the way through. Uh, the the uh, requirements are are linked um, let me just close this and we expand this guy. Go. And um, let's go to one of the diagrams. So if you have a diagram here and let's say, let's use the action diagram here. And then I want to associate that with a requirement. I would just come over here, 
to the relationships, and I don't know whether this has one uh, requirement associated with it. I think it might. Yeah. So it satisfies a requirement here is what they may use satisfies by. Um, I, I prefer to use traced, <laughs> but that's fine. Uh, traced to. Um, but so, so again, all I do is click on that one. There's my requirement. So I go right to that from that view. I, I have other views too, but that's probably a quick, quick way to do what you're saying. And again, if I want to add requirements, I can easily do that through that relationship. All right, thank you. That concludes the question and answer portion of the webinar. We would like to thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. Make sure to join us next time for our next webinar, What's New in InnoSlate 4.4, on February 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. As always, we will also send the recording and slide deck to everyone that attended today. For more resources, we encourage you to visit our website and our blog, as well as connect with us on social media through the InnoSlate user group or through Twitter using the handle at InnoSlate. That concludes today's presentation. Thank you again for your attendance, and we hope to see you again at our next webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day.